Good. How are you? Excellent. Thanks uh, for joining us today. All the way from uh, Dallas. So uh, for people watching or listening, uh, really excited to have Lisa Pope, the president at Epicor. Uh, this is episode 116, uh, I believe. Uh, for those that are uh, members of sales community, thank you so much. For those that are not, you can go to salescommunity.com and in, I think, upper left-hand corner, you see something that says winter free, so you get a free year membership that way. And uh, we also have uh, Sandler as our uh, sponsor today uh, for this podcast. They're the training sponsor of a uh, sales community. And uh, Tucker, thanks for putting up those links there. So uh, people probably know, uh, I tell the Sandler folks, it's probably one of, one of the best names uh, in terms of brand name and awareness. But uh, although they have you know hundreds of customers, there's a lot of people that still aren't, aren't that aware. Uh, so they've got fantastic consulting services, help with talent development tools, technology, enablement, and uh, cutting edge content. Uh, they've got really impressive programs going on that are delivering the outcomes that sales leaders like us have always looked for relative to improving the most important KPIs, such as revenue margins, renewals, market share, reduction in sales time, et cetera. So our ROI they have is uh, amazing. And uh, you can check out their website. It has a ton of great content. Also, lots of great use cases uh, by industry. Uh, as always, we have uh, Tucker behind the scenes helping. So Tucker, thank you so much. Uh, so getting into uh, Lisa here. So uh, live in uh, the, the big D in Dallas. Uh, so I think uh, any anybody, whether you're born there or, or flying there, to kind of put something in the water and you got to be a Cowboys fan, right? Absolutely. Huge Cowboys fan. Um, and uh, even uh, made it to the Super Bowl this year, although not with the Cowboys, unfortunately, but I uh, did get a chance to go. There you go. Yeah. So as, as a uh, Patriots fan, I can honestly say, I you know, I dislike both teams just as much. So I really didn't care at all. Did you have a preference? Uh, I was rooting for the Chiefs, a uh, big Patrick Mahomes fan. He uh, went to Texas Tech, and uh, so there's a lot of loyalty uh, for them here. Uh, there you go. And uh, you've got four sons, two daughters-in-law, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and actually one grandson, which uh, seems amazing. You're into boating, skiing, skydiving, uh, and uh, you uh, being a sports fan, like I know you, I'm sure you, you probably already did your bracket, right? I did. I did. I went with some unconventional picks, but uh, we'll see how I do. You know, it's a million dollar cha challenge if you win. So there you go. Who do you have winning it? Uh, a team on the uh, West Coast, Gonzaga. So uh, I, I lived on the West Coast. I've got some some roots there and big, uh, big fan of basketball. My uh, youngest son played uh, actually with Clay Thompson in high school. So oh, wow. There's quite a bit of connection there, but yeah, I, I, I like to look for that little bit of the underdog. Oh, there you go. It was great watching uh, toward the end of the season, the Gonzaga St. Mary's games. I mean, it's, it's yeah. so cool, two schools like that. I've, I've got a son at uh, Alabama where, where there's an Alabama flag here somewhere. Yeah, right there. So yes, I mean, yes. it's, it's easy. You take the number one pick. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, so anyway, so to help with the, and, oh, and then we originally, we met through Michael Madden and, uh, so unlike some of the other guests who really have not worked, uh, really, uh, much together at all, but you're definitely highly respected. You're obviously been super successful. And then in, uh, preparing for this has uh, been really amazing to see uh, all your great talents. So look forward to sharing those with our uh, guests today. Great. Uh, so I got a couple of intros. So uh, Andy Cousins, who's at Epicor, uh, SVP of International, says Lisa's awesome, uh, a really great uh, sales leader, big sports fan, and uh, uh, went to the Super Bowl. Uh, Steve Murphy, who's a CEO I know from uh, year years ago as well. And when I texted him, uh, and obviously, uh, full disclosure, was yesterday, it was late. He actually called me and said, hey, Randy, let me tell you how great she is. But uh, she's one of the best in the industry trained by the best at Oracle. She's a big part of the success of Epicor. Uh, you're awesome at value-based selling and you're so smooth that no one notices what's going on. Uh, you pull out so much great information from uh, customers and uh, customers always come away feeling better about Epicor because of you, which I think, how, how nice is that? That's pretty nice, yeah. I am very, uh, very client-facing, customer-facing, a field general, so to speak. So that, that means a lot to me. There you go. Awesome. 
Uh, and, I, and I do, I'll, I send these comments as a follow-up. So that way you kind of have that in your file. <laughs> <laughs> you need it. So we jump into the question. So you went um, undergrad UC Santa Barbara, and then your first job uh, was at Triad Systems, right? That is correct. And Epicor actually ended up buying Triad Systems, but they uh, sold software into the hard goods and automotive aftermarket. So I sort of ended up full circle back where I started. Oh, awesome. And then maybe take us through your career from there you know, in, in CR through uh, Epicor. Yeah, I, uh, I was a pre-sales person actually at Triad Systems and so really learned uh, the customer side of the business, right? They had us go to clients, work with clients and learn the software. Uh, so when I went to NCR, I was actually hired in on the pre-sales side to be a software specialist for the distribution and manufacturing uh, hardware teams. So again, very focused on the, the software side. Um, was there for about eight years and got an opportunity to work with some really large aerospace and defense companies out in Southern Cal. Uh, and Oracle came and recruited me for, from, for one of the large accounts there. So ended up staying at Oracle for uh, seven years and basically from that strategic account role moved into sales, uh, regional sales VP, uh, and then into a national uh, VP for their strategic account. So learned a lot, uh, was there during a very, um, very uh, uh, fast uh, growth time for Oracle. So that was exciting to see. Uh, and then got an opportunity to uh, move into an executive leadership role at QAD. They were based in Santa Barbara. So I had some shared connections uh, with their founders, Pam and Carl Locker, who also had gone to UC Santa Barbara. Uh, and oddly enough, so did Jeff Henley, who was the CFO at the time of Oracle. So yeah. there was quite a, a Santa Barbara software uh, group going there, but great opportunity there. Learned a lot about global business, uh, very focused on manufacturing and automotive, um, really incredible company. And, and because of that expertise on the, um, the leadership team, got to be able to be outside my roots, sort of in sales, do acquisitions, you know, help decide on benefits and just participate in really becoming an executive, not just a sales exec. Um, and then Infor recruited me away to run their global cloud business um, and really help their customers make that decision to move to the cloud. Um, really great leadership team there uh, with Chuck Phillips, um, just incredible uh, group. Uh, and then Epicor basically hired me away to come really recharge the company put it back on a, a path for growth, similarly move more of their customers and uh, their sales teams into the cloud, uh, and then really get a chance, I think, to uh, to drive the next level in terms of leadership. So I've been there now six years, so it's been great, and uh, have, have really seen all all facets of ERP, thinking you know all the way back uh, to uh, to obviously now. So 30 years of being in this specific industry. Wow. It's amazing. And, uh, yeah, during those go, go years at Oracle, I mean, only the, the, the strong and the best survive and also get promoted. So congratulations, not no disrespect to any of the other companies, but really yeah. congratulations for that. So maybe, uh, briefly tell us a little bit about Epicor. Yeah. So Epicor, uh, we're about a billion dollar software company. I, you know, I used to say we're the, the company that nobody really had heard about, right? So if I was on a plane and I'm like, well, I'm in ERP, you know, the obvious is Oracle, SAP. And so I'd be like, no, I work for Epicor. And they'd be like, okay, so tell me about Epicor. And, and it was sort of like, well, we're sort of a smaller version of Oracle or SAP. But I think the truth is, is quite different, right? I think uh, what Epicor does is we focus very specifically on the make, move and sell supply chain and very focused across essential companies. So this obviously played very well during you know, the last four to five years, especially as, as those supply chains became so critical in our foundation uh, and just in our economic growth. But manufacturing, distribution and retail and really only five verticals across that uh, if we look at lumber and building materials and automotive. Uh, so unlike a lot of our software competitors who may have you know, go after 30 verticals, we really focus on those five connected verticals and have you know, very specialized products for each of those specific um, uh, verticals and, and, and very specialized people and teams that sort of understand that space uh, better than our co uh, competitors. So that tends to be where we, we pretty much focus. 
Um, we now, you know, we have 4,000 employees, we're in 120 companies, so we definitely have the scale of a large company, but uh, I guess still small enough to really care and really have that customer touch uh, and client-centric approach, which again is a big reason for me coming here. Wow, awesome. And uh, you also are kind of, I guess, have gone through the transition of the uh, on-prem to the cloud. So from a kind of, if you can uh, maybe, uh, if there's you know two or three kind of go-to-market priorities, uh, what would those be for the next year? Yeah, I think the cloud is still is still key. If you think about our industries again, especially global manufacturing, you know they were slower to move to the cloud, right? They they still were heavy on premise, uh, still uh, had a lot of specialized plants, um, and being on one big global instance. Uh, in a lot of cases was not the approach they wanted. So I think we still have an opportunity to continue to move a lot of our customers that still are on premise um, into a cloud environment. And that will still continue to be a priority because I, I, you know, I firmly believe that that's, you know, step one, if you want to sort of be, um, you know, a digital transform business and really be able to move forward, you've got to, that's got to be the, the first phase that you go through. Um, but in addition to that, I think the other big areas that we're seeing is, is really a, a focus around the supply chain. And so in some cases, that's our companies consolidating and actually purchasing uh, pieces of their supply chain so that they own it, um, which means that some of our core verticals have started to overlap. So our, some of our distributors are doing light manufacturing now, and some of our, you know, obviously, even if you're a manufacturer, you want um, retail, you want your end consumers to be able to reach out and buy your products directly. So we're actually seeing our verticals converge quite a bit. Uh, and that's been exciting from a go to market perspective, because we're, we've got specialized resource in all of them, and we're able to really help navigate with our clients. Uh, as they decide to maybe move into sort of an adjacent uh, part of their business. Um, and then the third big thing for us is really focusing on data as a service. And again, I think once you've got, you know, all of your systems in the cloud, you've got your business flows and your automation done, the next obvious thing is, you know, what do we do with all that information and data? And for us, again, because of our supply chain focus, we're able to really dive into specific use cases for clients about where products should be in order for it to sell better, uh, what products should be made where for better cost and for better, you know, everything from the transportation side down to where are we going to deploy those products. So I think for us, that's our, 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 our next big thing, right, is continuing to evolve uh, and provide those insights to our customers. Wow, awesome. And uh, I should have mentioned earlier, so I saw there's a LinkedIn user who says another great session with a fantastic guest. So thank you for whoever that uh, is. Uh, but for those watching or listening, feel free to make any other comments. And certainly uh, we, we always encourage questions. So uh, Tucker does a great job behind the scenes pulling those up. So please feel free. So in terms of your ideal customer profile, if you think about kind of, I'll say the titles at the companies that you're selling to, kind of who are the kind of executive decision makers? Yeah, for us, a lot of it is the CFO. Uh, we've seen a lot of consolidation of systems now under more of the CFO's office. Um, I think for a couple of reasons. One, when, when people started to consider going to the cloud, there were a lot of questions around just the costs associated with that, the TCO involved with that. And we saw the CFO's office being more engaged and involved in that decision. Also, um, the security. So whether that's under the CIO or there, in some cases, there's a chief security officer. Again, a lot more visibility into that being a major driver for why customers want to consider going to the cloud. They, they don't want to worry about all of maintaining all of that themselves. So between the CFO and the CIO, we see a, a lot of interest. And then clearly, um, because our system does expand really across the entire business flow, um, you know, it's not unusual for us to have 10 different departments, you know, 20 different individual demonstrations that happened with, you know, the people in finance, the people in manufacturing, the people in operations and procurement, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it is still very much an enterprise focus and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of constituents that get involved. But as I said, a lot of interest uh, and a lot of visibility, I think, um, with the CFO specifically. So in terms of your TAM, total addressable market, it's a kind of 
kind of fixed number, right? So what is it like a thousand, two thousand companies, if that? No, I mean, when we look at our uh, total addressable market, we basically focus on everything from SMB up to enterprise. Oh, okay. So we literally can start at a, you know, a small a store that's owned by the founder uh, that has, you know, basically, you know, 10 employees and, and the wife's doing the accounting. Okay all the way up to you know ace headquarters or the larger companies that run our products um, in the lumber and building material space so we do sell into billion dollar enterprises as well um, i think our market really has been expanded also just given the acquisitions we've done um, because as we've acquired additional products that definitely opens up even if it's not um, a new customer segment for us it may be a, a new product segment within our customers, right? Where before, uh, you know, another company maybe had owned that particular, um, you know, product uh, specialty. Gotcha. And that kind of dovetails into uh, Ryan Ressert's uh, second question. Curious what channels your sales reps are using to reach out and start conversations. So I'd imagine is that uh, SMB group, is that kind of like an in inside sales group? And then the larger, you know, largest accounts, those are kind of proper kind of, um, yeah, we, we definitely have things very segmented in the company. We start with a business development team. Um, we hire them traditionally right out of school, a lot of training, um, including on-site training where they go to Epicor customers and see what's happening. Um, and they're co-located with our sales teams. We find that that immersion to be really important. So um, those BDRs are the ones that are doing most of the initial outreach, the conversations. Um, both inbound and outbound. And then from there, um, those people then move up through the chain. So from there, they'll typically go into being a customer account manager in the smaller segments. As they get experience there, they may go into mid-market or enterprise customer sales, or they may decide that they want to actually move into more of the net new side of selling. Um, but we find that business development team, a lot of the core skills around um, prospecting, answering questions, and that side of it have really helped. Um, and I'm proud to say that um, I now have uh, a few vice presidents that work for me that directly came up through our BDR team. So we, we do a good job not just recruiting them, retaining them, and really developing them for the next level. Wow, that's great. So then I would imagine the the kind of the SMB further down in the pyramid, a lot of that is pure raw cold calling. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Although we do get a lot of reference um, sales from, you know, a small association. So we're big because we are so industry focused, working with local industry associations. And so they'll hear about us from someone else there and they may just reach out and say, hey, we're interested in this. But yeah, we do do quite a bit of cold calling, um, a lot of webinars, you know, to get interest. And then obviously at the larger level, um, the big areas for us that have really helped is around uh, selection consultants, which um, you know we've really catered to in the last two years and seen a tremendous increase of leads and opportunities through those influencers and also through private equity. So we see a lot of proliferation of private equity in all of our core verticals. And so getting to know those private equity companies, um, understanding how they buy, which is very different than say, uh, you know, other companies, uh, they basically want to get implemented very quickly, get a quick return, and then they may be looking at selling that company in three years. So they're not going to take a traditional, let's take seven months to decide who we're going to buy and then take a year and a half to put the system in. Um, so we've really changed our selling process in terms of how we go after those companies and the private equity entities at the, at the top of that chain. Oh, very good. I mean, it's it's good news, bad news, right? So if you got a great ROI, those private equity companies are all, are all over it. So you can get that spend versus probably other companies that may not be as sharp and crisp, you know, competing for the same dollar. Yeah. And I think, I mean, we heard that a few of them when we first worked with them, they said, you guys want to do like six days of demos. And we're like, no, we don't have six days. Like come in, like, you know, and once they know obviously your solution and they feel confident with it, then a lot of that selling time goes away. It's very much like, is this a good fit? Yes, you guys have done this now for us 10 times. You've got the systems up and running. We're getting a great return. How quick can you do it? So that's a, a very different you know, sale and style of selling 
than someone that is maybe hired a selection consultant and is going to look at eight different companies and go through a very formal process. So again, we have a specialized team that just focuses on private equity for that reason. Wow. Th thinking about demos, I don't know if you ever came across John McMahon. I was with him last week and he's um, going to be uh, ne next week on our podcast. So he was PTC medic and uh, he has this uh, really good book, uh, Qualified uh, Sales Leader. But he tells a story of P PTC, the go-go years. The uh, yeah, they do the sales call and the customer says, "Okay, great, we'll we'll, we'll take a uh, you know demo or do a trial." They said, "No, no, no, we don't do it. You, you buy it now." <laughs> so yeah. that's a good way to uh, you know, shorten shorten the sales cycle as long as they uh, buy off on it. Uh, exactly. And then. Uh, and then Ryan, uh, I know Ryan's at the uh, Phone Ready, Ready Leads, which is a great company. Uh, says, curious, uh, where you? I'd imagine your sales team is quite busy serving businesses uh, in the supply chain. So during the kind of COVID, those kind of supply chain type companies, was that like super busy or, or was it slow because things were so crazy? Yeah, it was, um, it was very busy. All of our clients, I mean, 98% were deemed essential. And so we were kind of surprised. We didn't see customers stop implementations um, and we didn't see sales cycles stop. So we basically, you know, continued to travel. Um, we did do some adjustments where people that were closer to things that could drive, you know, we adjusted some territories and also on the services side, uh, really developed some remote capabilities, which I think, frankly, have become a best practice now, where before we felt we had to do everything on site. We've done much better job sort of understanding what can be done virtually and what can be done on site. But we were extremely busy during COVID. Uh, a number of our clients also had to shift emphasis, maybe if they were making, you know, plastic, um, you know, machineries and, and uh, things for office buildings. Now they were making plastic shields that went up on, you know, for, for hospitality. So there was a lot of um, work even from our development teams to sort of help address questions or how I, how would I change this? How would I shift this? Um, so we were extremely busy and, and, and I think that did help fuel a lot of our growth. Uh, we didn't ever really get to that point where we were all hunkered down sort of at home. Um, so that's, it was a really an exciting time for us. Oh, awesome. Uh, so we have uh, Tucker from John O'Keefe. Uh, I guess I can do both questions at the same time. Has the macro environment impacted sales productivity? Uh, and do, do you have any priorities to raise sales productivity? Yeah, you know, I think um, it's interesting. I, I was just looking at all the, the statistics that were coming out. And again, we our verticals are really, really specific. So for us, we do look at things like the PMI index, right? For lumber and building materials, it's home starch, right? Price of lumber, things like that, that sort of drive concern. Um, you know, and so I think we have not seen any kind of real slowdown despite uh, watching you know, the six o'clock news, uh, we still see customers investing in technology. Uh, we have not seen projects get canceled because of any concern over the economy. Um, so I think for us, in terms of just our sales teams, you know, they are busy. Um, but I do think we did learn quite a bit during the pandemic in terms of leveraging, as I said, tools like the video more often um, and, and just all the qualification capabilities that we're doing. Um, and then leveraging the ecosystem, right? I mentioned the selection consultants and private equity, but that's been a tremendous amount of lead generation for us that traditionally we would have had to, you know, go and do ourselves, right? And so um, extending your, your ecosystem and really understanding how that can help uh, drive uh, your leads and ultimately your pipeline, I think is key. Um, one of the things I talk about is sort of um, growing, you know, growing the business to grow the business. I really have three specific areas. And, and the first one is growing mind share. So before I worry about growing market share or wallet share, which are the other two, mind share to me is, is crucial. And that is everything from your brand. But it also includes this ecosystem. It's do the influencers know us? Do they know our story? Does Randy know us? Are we out talking to people, right? Are we visible on LinkedIn? Um, you know, are we being profiled to speak at industry events, right? So, and I really challenge all of my sales leaders and sales managers and even our sales teams directly. Your job is to also grow mindshare within your reach, right? Your community um, and your ecosystem. So I think 
once that started to happen at Epicor, and that's really, we've seen a huge change in the last two years. Um, it's like your brand gets out there, there's more people talking about you, and then ultimately that helps lead to more opportunities to where you can grow your market share. Um, and ultimately, once you land that customer, growing the wallet share within that client. No, oh, good. Uh, great question, John. Thanks. Um, so moving on before I forget, so our title topic is ERP dead. So I, I think of, e, of a ERP kind of old, tired, it's legacy. You know, if I'm a seller, hey, I want to go for the next new hot thing. Why the heck would I ever want to do anything with ERP? But yet you've had amazing kind of retention and amazing results. So kind of what, what's the real, I'm sure I, uh, my perspective is perception. So you can let me know what reality is. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I, I've been in this market for 30 years, so it's also, uh, for me, I think, um, looking at software, uh, maybe in, with a different lens, right? So when, when I really look at it, you know, there was a reason back in 2000, people went to ERP, they were worried about a date change and a system failure, right? We saw the pandemic drive a lot of people into new ERP systems in the cloud because they needed remote capabilities for their workers. And all of a sudden security became a huge issue, right? And so for me, the, the, the beauty of ERP is really the ability to sort of reinvent um, the messaging around that, um, the business value that you take to the client based on these market conditions. Um, and we've been very successful, you know, doing that at Epicor for sure. But I would say even for me over my career, I've been able to do that very successfully working for some of the most, you know, the largest ERP companies that are out there um, by really thinking and, and making sure that the message follows with what, what's happening. So now a lot of it is around digital transformation. It's about engaging, you know, and bringing in new technologies, whether that's IoT or artificial intelligence. Um, all of those things are great, but if they're not connected to the backbone of your company, which is basically that digital platform of ERP, they're not going to do you any good and you're not going to get the same kind of results. So I think for us, that's really our message is, you know, first, you've got to get that backbone. It's got to be modern. It needs to be in the cloud and it needs to be business flow um, orchestrated. Um, and I think that's one of the advantages we're seeing in terms of re a resurgence now is that for a while, a lot of companies did let each department go pick their own system, right? I think in our, even in our marketing department, at one point we had 20 different marketing products, right? Because everybody needed one little piece and then they don't talk together, they're not integrated, um, or we didn't have one solid view of the customer. And so I told you earlier, but that's one of the big transformations we're on is sort of an entire quote to cash view of our customers that will enable our sales reps all the way through uh, through the customer billing and then into the service side so that we will have one single view of our customers uh, at any given point. And it's really hard to do that when each department goes out and picks, you know, 10 different solutions. So that's really, uh, so ERP is not dead. I think if anything, um, when we look at the next thing, which is data as a service and insights and really intelligent decision-making, again, having that, that single platform um, really enables you to do that. So. Uh, but I think it is a great message for sales. Um, I mentioned earlier about the tenure we have at Epicor. I'm really proud of that, especially on the sales side. Our average uh, tenure is over 10 years. You just wow. don't see that in software. Sales. Um, and I think that's why, because we continue to, you know, you know, really focus in on what is the message and the value of the system now versus a sales rep maybe thinking every two years, I got to go to the next cool, hot product, you know, in order to sell. Um, and I, I think the opposite is the truth. So um, just a different perspective, but definitely it's not dead, definitely thriving and uh, lots of growth, obviously not just at our company, but many of our competitors too that are focused in on these markets. Wow, that's great. Yeah, I mean, you've been there six years. I mean, most people in your shoes would be 18 months. Uh, CEO uh, Murph has been there for how long? Six years as well, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's rare. You get the CEO, you get the go-to-market leader, and yeah. then, you know, having the reps are 10 years. I mean, you know, a lot of companies you see. Our services. You know, yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm out of here, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. uh, kudos, to, kudos to you guys for sure. So if you had some great awards, uh, 2021 Sales Executive of the Year from uh, Best in Business. Uh, last year, the Stevie Award for Sales and Customer Service for Woman of the Year. 
So those awards are great, but uh, obviously uh, you've done amazing with uh, some diversity best practices. Can you maybe touch on a couple of those? Yeah, I mean, that that is important to me. I started off uh, in sales in a um, male dominated industry as well. So not just in high tech sales, but then, you know, I'm not selling into fashion, right? Or, you know, retail, uh, at least not the fun side of the retail business. So for me, um, I've been in sort of manufacturing, distribution, automotive my whole life. Um, so, you know, I think um, part of it is it, it really does sort of start with the top and sort of trying to recruit um, and bring um, talent into the organization. Um, I do that quite extensively. I've been involved with a, a number of local colleges trying to ensure that that we're reaching out to people that may be very good presenters uh, that have a business background like I did that, you know, maybe don't want to go be an accountant or don't want to go right. do that job and say, why not think about software, either pre-sales or sales, right. uh, you can really do great here. So I think part of it is it's recruiting at that level. Um, and then also, I think for me, being at the level I'm at, I have other women leaders who want to come work for me and stay probably because the environment is good. And so we have been uh, very good at Apricor continuing to promote from within um, and make sure that we're giving people the opportunity. But, um, you know, whether it's a woman or it's just diversity, even in the executive team um, with all sorts of races, I mean, it is an important uh, area now. Um, especially when we look at, you know, what's going on globally. But um, that is something I, I certainly take pride on. And, you know, uh, I also belong to uh, a woman's executive um, uh, uh, co committee or I guess club is, is a good way to put it. Yeah. Chief, yes. Um, and it's uh, it's a great organization that really empowers women to work with other women and help them as they navigate their career. And Honestly, you know, half the conversations aren't about work necessarily. It's about how they balance uh, maybe dealing with an individual at work that is troublesome and just helping someone sort of through issues and challenges that maybe you've seen. So, you know, these were things that just didn't exist when I was young in my career. Um, so it's exciting for me to see now that women have a little bit more uh, support um, than, than they had in the past. Yeah, they, uh, great, great comments there for sure. And uh, a lot of times I get asked, hey, you know, how can we improve diversity? How can we improve women in sales? I mean, you kind of have the population that you have. I totally agree with what you said is, you know, you really need to go back to the schools because there are so many that have sales programs. I'm always shocked by the number of schools that do not have sales programs, which is crazy because most people, especially liberal arts schools, end up in sales anyway, but kind of go and cultivate, right. you know, that population and say, hey, it can be a great job. You know, the, you know, no matter what you decide to do in life, you can, you know, something that you, you can do forever. So I think that's really what needs to be the big push, don't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's crazy. And then I'll give it another shout out. So for International Women's Day, I love uh, your shout out to, you called it your two amazing daughters-in-law. I don't know if they're listening or not. Uh, Katie Black, who's a senior project manager at Intuitive and Mary uh, Pope, who's a privacy advisor at USAA. So Love that. Very cool there. <laughs> yeah, they're great. And, um, you know, they make, obviously, uh, my son stronger. Um, so, you know, and they both met at college, um, one in Boston. They're both biomed engineers. And then the others uh, at TCU. Um, and then Mary Louise went on to law school. So, you know, really good diversity um, in terms of just, you know, their, their backgrounds, where they came from. Um, and they're just amazing women. So it's great to sort of support that next younger generation for sure. Yeah. It was fun watching the uh, T TCO TCU run, you know, <laughs> up yeah, until, it was. Last game, but... until the last, until the last game. But, um, you know, I've been a big sports fan. I was pretty vocal about not liking, um, the whole selection process in football, right? Because I'm a basketball fan. And so I love yeah. Mark Madness because everybody gets a chance. And I always felt football was sort of, you know, skewed towards brands. So yeah. I use the same terminology a lot when I talk about Epicor because our brand was sort of a tier two brand. And so other people get invited to opportunities that we may not. And I, I use that analogy a lot with sports. So. You know, I, I know this year TCU got a great shot. Um, I don't think anybody could have beat Georgia on that day, but Alabama could have. What are you talking about? Oh, I don't know. Not that. Not this year. 
but um but i do think it was it was great to see see that happen yeah. so um but yeah it was heartbreaking uh certainly at the end of it but uh what a great run so awesome and then i'm just going to keep moving on but i'll just give some other shout outs so you've got a uh your insights conference in may you've got jerry seinfeld there so that's awesome um, you're an ERP partner for a uh, Formula One car, Scuderia, Alpha, Tori. Uh, so really cool there. Saw the car got unveiled at New York Fashion Week. Mm -hmm. uh, Epicord is a cool podcast called Man Manufacturing the Future, hosted by Kerry Jordan. Uh, and also I love, love that uh, you guys are back doing the sales trips. So you got your uh, 100 top sales pros at your sales of excellence uh, trip at the Four Seasons in Punta Mita. And I think you said you actually, you did the club trips even during COVID? We did. We, I mean, part of it was the way our fiscal year fell. So we had the ability to not cancel one that was pre-COVID. Yeah. And then um, the other one, we, we couldn't go to Hawaii, but we had a lot of skiers. We ended up going to Jackson Hole. Nice. Um, and did sort of a winter, you know, uh, yeah. location that, that clearly people were not worried about the virus. Um, so um yeah we we definitely i think mainly our like we said our our reps were all flying and still traveling to clients so there was a thought like then how do we cancel the, the award trip you know they're, they're yeah. out working so that we we need to keep it going yeah love that i uh i, I fell into corbett's cool cool once so that's my <laughs> my claim to fame um all right so a couple uh kind of quick, quick uh questions so one is uh, any advice for people breaking into tech sales? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think it is tough. I mean, forget the economic situation. I just think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's highly specialized. So I think my advice is, is be really specific about your background and your skills. Um, and if you don't feel that you know enough about a specific industry or a specific area, then take the time to really dive down and learn. Because I think, that is what ends up getting hired. I, I see so many resumes that come across. And for me, it is somebody that that actually has either worked in that industry. So, for example, I'll give you an idea. But like I will go hire somebody who's worked at a distribution company or a manufacturing company or a retailer because they know the customer that we're serving. Right. right? I can teach them some of the other things about software sales. Um, but if they've got sales background and know the industry, that's that's a unique skill set that that I will look for that maybe other recruiters that wouldn't necessarily you know hit their frame of mind. Secondly, definitely leverage your network. So, and again, that gets back to what I said earlier about Mindshare and your personal ecosystem. Um, I can't stress that enough, especially if you're young in career, is to is to continue to leverage that. Um, and leverage the, the people that you know. And that includes, if you, if you are really young in career, your parents' friends, right? I always said, I won't hire my own kids, and I haven't, and I won't, uh, or grandkids for that uh, matter, uh, when they're old enough. But, but I will look, and, and at least, you know, someone that I know, I will definitely take that resume and say, okay, move that into somebody and say, hey, this is somebody that I do know, put them through the process. And sometimes that, that makes the difference, right? It's just they still got to get the job on their own, but they at least get a, a, a you know a chance at that. Great. And then uh, for advice for those impacted by recent layoffs and tech sales, maybe uh, one uh, piece of advice. Yeah, that's uh, that's a tough one right now. I mean, there's just a lot of hiring freeze, so unfortunately, patience is is going to be part of it. Uh, but but again, go back to your network, uh, people that you used to work for, especially that are connected. Um, if somebody calls me that's worked in my with one of me on one of my teams before, I'm very likely to say, OK, let me see if I can you know, personally try to get you in front of three or four people that I know. Uh, and that's probably the easiest way. Great. And we have a question from Jesse. Uh, should sales managers bail their SDR team out of LinkedIn and email jail? Uh, so I, I get confused on these on these questions. <laughs> so Jesse, feel free to rephrase. So I assume that if I'm a uh, BDR SDR, I'm doing a lot in uh, LinkedIn. Uh, so the LinkedIn may shut me off because I'm doing too many outreaches. And maybe with email, things are going to junk if the company doesn't have the kind of e email system set up. So I don't know if you have a perspective on this or not. 
Well, I mean, I, I think that is just part of it. I mean, I think about how many outreaches I get a day and, and not being able to respond to all of them or, or necessarily be interested. Um, so that whole spam folder issue is a real challenge. And that's why sometimes trying to make a phone call uh, can differentiate. That's why I think, you know, the technology is great, but sometimes it does actually take going out and doing things in person uh, individually meeting at associations or doing things within your community to also look for, for ways to break out of that because you can't reach everybody now, you know, virtually there's definitely an overload. Definitely. Um, so thanks, Jesse. I think we're able to figure it out. Uh, and what about your, uh, perspective? I know you were kind of early on in your career, uh, involved with, uh, uh, global sales training and enablement. Mm -hmm. um, so from a kind of sales training perspective, um, how do you view the importance of that? Kind of how does Epicor do it? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a passion of mine. Um, I run our global sales kickoff, um, which is basically focused on uh, motivate, educate and celebrate in that order. Right. So um, I really believe um, each sales kickoff is an opportunity to have your entire sales team get recommitted to the company. Right. So it's a big part of our uh, retention strategy, both with you know, younger reps, but also with our seasoned reps uh, that you know, our competitors are constantly trying to recruit. Um, so for me personally, our kickoff is one of our largest training events. Um, we do a lot of motivational things too. I mentioned skydiving earlier, but um, both myself and Andy Cousins did a motivational sky jump when we were trying to get people to think about moving to the cloud. So we did the whole cloud theme. Oh, you got Andy to do it? I did. I did. It was really fun. I'll, I'll, I'll have to give you the video at some point. But and then we come on stage with our jump suits, and it was like you know. If we can do this, you can do this. And then the whole thing was basically, you know, teaching them how to really focus on a, a cloud TCO. Uh, and this was a number of years ago, but, but bottom line, uh, then that whole training then went right into, okay, how do you get to the CFO? How do you have a conversation about to the CFO about the value of moving to the cloud? Um, here's the, the TCO financial analysis that we've prepared. We're going to help you do that. Here's your security questions, right? So really sort of very specific training. Um, and although we do use outside content, um, we'll take that outside content, work with a smaller group first, and then we tend to want to deliver it ourselves. Um, I, and I use my sales VPs for that. Um, not all of them are uh, love that because it is a lot of work for them after they finish their fiscal year a month later to show up and basically engage in this. But uh, we found that it's, it's much stickier for the reps if the, the people delivering that content actually are part of the company uh, and we sort of put the Epicor spin on it. So definitely a huge passion of mine. And um, I do feel it makes a big difference in retaining, um, you know, the tenure that we have. Awesome. And uh, sh shout out to Sandler, who's our uh, sales training sponsor of sales community. Uh, so moving on, what about uh, kind of how you view today the importance of, I guess, what used to be called sales ops, now uh, rev ops? Yeah, it's uh, it's really critical and important. Um, you know, there's so much data and information, right? I look at our uh, Salesforce. We also use Clary for forecasting. Um, and you know, when there's three weeks left in the quarter, and you're like, okay, where are things trending? Um, what does the pulse look like? Where am I compared to this exact minute of this day? You know, last year at Q2. Um, or even last quarter, depending on you know how your uh, your cycles work. But I think uh, for me, sales operations has turned you know into something a lot more strategic. So for us, I mentioned our uh, project for quote to cash. Um, our sales operations team is really leading that charge and really looking on how we build best practices in. Uh, and then the second piece of it for me, as I said, is really providing me more insights into what's happening versus, hey, I built you this, this view or this report. Uh, it's really coming to me and saying, hey, we're trending ahead here or we're behind here. These are the things that we're seeing. Um, and then being able to make that, you know, really simple all the way down to, to the rep themselves. So definitely a strategic role. I think it's really critical in, in today's, you know, sort of there's so much information out there. Uh, that operational angle, I think, is really turned into much more of a strategic analytics side. Uh, and certainly the hires that we've been making, that's that's the trend we're looking for is people who bring 
I'd almost use the word data science. You know, I know that's a little, that's, you know, the, the hot college degree right now, but bringing people in that know how to assess and analyze data um, that can help us operate the business is really where I see that direction going. Yeah, I mean, I, I always like to say the old days was you could look, you know, the data was kind of the rear view mirror, kind of where you've been okay. now with uh, Gong, a bunch of other tools. It's kind of, you know, wh where are you going? What are you doing? How are you doing it? You mentioned you know, clarity, but kind of just the access to this data to be able to make decisions, to be able to know who's yeah. going to do what, where and when. I mean, it's cr crazy, isn't it? It's it's great. Works out amazing. And then uh, Jesse had chimed in on your comment before technology amplifies failure and success. I love the point. Thanks, Jesse. So as we're uh, wrapping up here, uh, a few more questions, so maybe uh, sh shorter answers because you can talk forever about all these, but um, maybe examples of sales leaders that uh, you respect, maybe if you want to pick a couple and why. Yeah, I mean, I think for me um, on the sales side, especially it's people that have come up through that industry background and training. And so, you know, if they started as a sales rep into a sales manager and, and really driven that all the way up through their uh, career, uh, for me, that that's definitely, you know, that's the highlight. Awesome. Uh, any names you want to mention? Um, not yeah. anybody specifically. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings because I have so many that I've worked with. Um, I think at Oracle, I probably had the, the strongest sales leaders that were out there. Um, and just the pace of that company was such yeah. that you were just moving at a, at a really different level. But um, but across the board, I've been lucky to work with some amazing people. That's great. Uh, do you ever work with Tony Fernicola? I do know Tony quite well from Oracle. Huh. Yes, he was more on the on the hardware side of the business for a while. Okay. Um, and yeah. on the technology side, right? So he had yeah. um, all the database side and, and I was more on the app side, but uh, yeah, he's a, he's a great example of that. And he also, um, I mean, he, he, knew, he was the uh, master of really working the network, right? His ecosystem, um, you know, he just, he knew so many people and he really leveraged that. And that was something I definitely learned from him. Yeah, he's, I mentioned him because he's, he's in uh, Na Naples here. Um, what about any uh, CEO leaders you respect? Well, I've had, um, I really have had the opportunity to work with very diverse CEOs, but I've learned an incredible amount really from all of them. Um, Charles Phillips was phenomenal at Infor. Um, I think he brought sort of a, very much a customer focused approach to Infor. I don't like the way he ran his leadership team. They, they literally sat in, in, at one table um, so they did not have individual offices and met and, and really worked through their day sitting together. So there was no walls between those offices, which meant everything was on the table all the time. So little um, harrowing to go in and present to your boss when everybody was listening, but, uh, oh. but he got things solved very quickly. And I, I, I really look back on that time and and, and we needed decisions made quickly, so it was phenomenal. And then working with Steve here uh, at Epicor the past six years has been great. Um, you know, he brought uh, some really specialized talent into the company. And I think one of the things I really like about the way he works is we really run our own shows, right? He, he gives us a lot of room to, to run our businesses, make our own decisions. We meet and he's always there if you've got a question or you know, a comment or a concern, if you need something escalated, but uh, you know, he, he doesn't micromanage. And I think that has allowed us to pivot quickly um, and grow the business as quickly as we have. Awesome. Hopefully he uh, gets out on sales calls too. Yes, of course. Yes, we do uh, both virtually and, and in person. All right, good. Uh, what about any uh, advice that you've received from uh, any mentors over the years? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, the number one piece of advice I have, and I also give it now, is really, um, you know, to take a year at a time. Um, and especially if you're in a sales um, related role, because it is very easy mid year or early in the year to sort of just get frustrated or have one thing sort of, you know, whether it's a new boss coming in. Um, that's happened to me many, many times in my career and really thinking, oh, no, I'm going to need to go. This isn't, you know, I, I don't feel safe here or this is going to be too difficult or too much of a change. And so this concept of sort of, you know, taking a deep breath and just letting things play out 
Um, and, and I had that advice early on in career when I was close to leaving, I ended up not leaving and ended up getting a much better promotion, you know, six months down the road than I would have if I had jump ship to take another opportunity. So I think it is really not overreacting and, and really thinking about it one year at a time. What do I want to accomplish and what do I need to do to sort of continue to grow and develop, you know, at this company? Um, versus sort of the nature is something happens and we immediately want to react. So that's my advice. Um, I think it's helped me. Uh, you know, my tenure at most of the companies has been seven to eight years, which again, for a sales exec is, is not usual. Um, and then also for my team. Yeah. Awesome. And then what are any advice you'd give your younger self? <laughs> um, I, I guess early on in career, I was probably pretty serious. So I think I've become um, a much more balanced person, but also I just think uh, like the teams that I'm running today and, and despite the fact that my job has been harder and I have you know a lot of weight on the shoulders, I, I bring a really good sort of collaborative, fun atmosphere to, to work every day. Whether that is, you know, talking about sports on the forecast call or just engaging with clients at the Formula One or the events, you know, early in career, I think I was really busy trying to prove myself. And I just I kind of separated my two lives to the point that um, it, it's just not healthy to do that. So I think for me, that would be it would have been like, you know, just loosen up, enjoy your job and, you know, make sure that you're bringing your personality and what's important to you into your job as well. Um, and, and I'm much happier now uh, working that way. Perfect. Awesome. Love it. And uh, we have from Michael Norton. Great advice right there. Thanks, Michael. So time flies when you're having fun. Uh, you've been awesome. So uh, for those watching, Lisa Pope, president at Epicor, lots of great words of wisdom. Uh, for uh, those that uh, are watching, you're able to benefit from this. Uh, for those, uh, and actually you should feel free to share it uh, with others. Uh, Tucker, we reposted across a whole bunch of different social mediums. Uh, next week, we have uh, John McMahon, who's um, you know, a legend for sure, but kind of father, godfather of Medic, MedPick, uh, has this great book, uh, Qualified Sales Leader, actually read right on the plane two, two weekends ago. And uh, just a wealth of uh, great knowledge and advice there uh, coming up, just, just like Lisa. So anyway, everybody have a great rest of the week. Uh, Lisa, thanks so much. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, thanks to uh, Sandler for sponsoring today. Thank you.